So this is actually going to be a bit of an other type of talk than what we have seen so far at ZIFCON. I figured since I'm on day two and right after lunch, everybody likes a good story after lunch, right? So by the show of hands, who is relatively new to the whole pen testing and red teaming field? Yeah, of course you are, yeah, sure. Okay, well, if you're not, then at least I hope you'll enjoy the trip down memory lane and have some nostalgia, because I'm actually going to talk about some of the things that I myself have stumbled into um, from the beginning of my pen testing career, transitioning into red teaming as well. And I'm hopefully um, going to touch upon some pain points that you probably had as well when you first started out. So with that said, the title of the talk is going to be Fun with Shellcode Loaders. And we are going to talk about a story. It's going to be the whole story from end to end. But of course, throughout the story, there are some key topics that I want to discuss. So I will talk about the fact that endpoint protection can be a little bit annoying, right? I'm going to talk about staged versus stageless, which I actually had a pretty interesting conversation about um, this, um, this lunch break. I'm going to talk about the, uh, the language of the runner, uh, the on-disk versus on-memory strategy, and then some lessons learned and some uh, quick OPSEC, OPSEC tips as well. So with that said, let's meet our main protagonist of this story, and this person is going to be Jimmy the Skid Johnson. Now, Jimmy the Skid Johnson is new to pen testing, and he was just doing some quote-unquote research on the internet and found a tutorial on YouTube on how to generate a meterpreter payload using, for example, the built-in MSF Venom in the Metasploit framework. So Jimmy, being hypnotized by how cool this all was, just followed the steps that were disclosed on the YouTube video and generated his first payload. Now, in the video, they showed them very nicely how to generate this executable, then just sent that uh, executable to a victim. The victim very easily just opened the executable and they had a reverse shell. So Jimmy mimicked exactly everything they did in the video, but he gets an email back from his victim saying, hey, Jimmy, I tried to execute this, but it didn't work. My antivirus actually complained, saying, hey, this, malicious, this binary, this thing that you sent me, is malicious. And Jimmy is now very confused because it worked in the YouTube video, so why didn't it work for him? So Jimmy was getting confused and he did some Google research and he found a website called VirusTotal. Now, pretty sure that pretty much all of you are quite familiar what, what VirusTotal exactly is. So Jimmy decides to take the binary that he um, created with MSF Venom, uploads it to VirusTotal and to his Shocking surprise, but probably not so shocking for all of us here in the audience. It got pretty well detected, right? It's like 52 out of 72, which was actually surprising to me as well, because I was thinking that it was even going to be higher than that. I thought it was going to be like 70 out of 72. So, interpreter out of the box, generated, shellcode, well, not even shellcode, right? Just a binary is still, for some antivirus products out there, undetected. So, that's quite, uh, quite insane. So Jimmy did some additional research, right? And he found a how-to wiki article on how to, act, how to hack his ex-girlfriend. And on this how-to wiki article, he learned about something that they describe as quote-unquote fileless malware, meaning he doesn't have to actually drop something to disk anymore. So Jimmy and his research looked for uh, more examples of fileless malware, and he found that the most easy way to deliver fileless malware would be using a PowerShell download cradle. So Jimmy tries it out. Again, with MSF Venom, there's actually a way to generate PowerShell as well, as I'm sure pretty much all of you knows. And now he once again, he actually learned his lesson. He didn't send that PowerShell script directly to his victim. He first uploaded it to VirusTotal. And it's actually already improving, right? The detection rate of the PowerShell version, which again, no obfuscation, just MSF Venom, is 27 detections. So again, not ideal, but it's already improving. So Jimmy was actually already quite surprised by this, and he's like, I'm okay, I'm, I'm on the right path. So Jimmy again is doing some research and reading up more and more and more, 
and he finds out that MSF Venom is in fact capable of doing something called payload encoding, and in some cases even some encryption algorithms as well. So Jimmy tries it out again, encodes the payload as described in an article, and this time he uploads the payload again to VirusTotal, and to his surprise, nothing changed. So he did change the encoding, but the detection rate is still 27. So now Jimmy is getting a little bit annoyed, right? Jimmy is like, what is going on? I do everything that the internet tells me to do, and I still get detected. So Jimmy is now a bit upset, and Jimmy starts looking at the PowerShell script that was generated by MSF Venom, and just out of sheer rage, drops about 90% of the payload, saves that file, and uploads it again to VirusTotal. So there's only a few lines left. He uploads those lines, and they are still getting detected. So Jimmy is now, what? I mean, this is not even malicious anymore. I actually disarmed the payload. I'm just uploading something that is clearly broken, but I'm still getting detected. So Jimmy, again, doing some research, found out that this is, of course, static detection. It's probably not something new to most of you in the audience. But essentially, I always say to my students, because I'm a SANS instructor, when I talk about static detections, it's glorified regular, uh, regular expressions, essentially. What I mean by that is, if there is some malicious string in your binary, the antivirus or even EDR solutions are going to compare it to what they call antivirus definitions. It's just going to be a database of some known bad strings. If you have too many known bad strings in your malware or in your payloads, whatever it is, it's going to complain and say, hey, this is inherently uh, malicious even if your payload is actually broken and is actually not doing anything malicious. Now, Jimmy found out that in order to bypass this, there's actually something called shellcode. And shellcode essentially allows you to generate a payload and then create a wrapper around it so you can influence how that particular piece of malware is getting loaded by the system. Now, what is interesting about this shellcode is in some frameworks, Metasploit is get, as again a prime example, you will once again have encoding and encryption, which could in fact um, drop your static signatures again. Now your mileage may vary depending on the encryption algorithms and even uh, encoders that you are using, but in general that is a good first step to take. So Jimmy again does his research and figures out to bypass static detections well, the fileless malware was actually the way to go, right? If we can figure out a way to dynamically load our payload in memory, we don't actually have to worry about static detections because static detections typically only occur on things that you drop to disk. So again, he does some research and he figures out, hey, if I use this completely filelessly, if I do this all in memory, I don't even have to worry about it anymore. So Jimmy tries this out, right? Jimmy sets up a, a, a staging server, essentially. He's hosting his malicious PowerShell um, on that particular staging server and is now using a pretty familiar to us PowerShell download cradle to try and execute his particular script from a staging server. And now, in his PowerShell prompt, Jimmy still gets, hey, this script contains malicious content and has been blocked by your antivirus ven uh, vendor. So as you can imagine, as Jimmy is doing all this research, he's still not getting anywhere closer. He's getting very frustrated, right? So Jimmy Googles this error that he gets from the PowerShell prompt, and he figures out that there's a thing called the anti-malware scan interface, also known as MC, which some of the speakers here today have already discussed as well, Alessandro being one of them. And Jimmy found out that there are pretty well-documented MC bypasses on the internet. So Jimmy tests an MC an, uh, an MC bypass out. He creates a little bit of his own flavor to it because he now knows about static detection. So he knows that he could potentially just change some strings around and hopefully that's going to work. And he actually was successful and created his own MC bypass, which was not yet flagged by an antivirus solution. So Jimmy, very happy with himself, is now going to include that MC bypass in his um, PowerShell script and is now going to load that PowerShell script again 
and to his surprise, it actually works now. He does get that Meterpreter reverse shell, so he is very happy. But now, through all the research that he has done so far, he also learned about things other than just antivirus products. He also learned about endpoint detect and response, EDR vendors essentially, which do a lot more than just relying on MC, just relying on static signatures as well. So Jimmy now knows that he is now successfully able to bypass some antivirus products, but he knows that he still doesn't have any chance against more mature endpoint products like an EDR. So Jimmy learned about static detections. He also learned a little bit more about dynamic detections. And of course, if you were here at ZIFCON this morning, Alessandro actually talked about static, uh, the dynamic detections as well, when he was talking about the user land hooks, so an EDR is going to inject into the process, is going to place some hooks to inspect API calls, and depending on the parameters that you give to those particular API calls, some logic is going to determine whether or not you are in fact doing something malicious. So the story continues, right? Jimmy figures out that if he wants to have more control, he will have to write some custom malware. He doesn't have to rely on uh, Metasploit anymore. And potentially, even if he wants to be really stealthy, really advanced, is going to have to rely on creating his own command and control framework. Now, creating your own command and control framework is a topic that is far from the actual um, thing that I want to convey here. So that is probably going to be for another talk, not this one. But Jimmy also learned that even with some popular frameworks out there, if we create what is called position-independent shellcode, this means that we could inject it with, for example, our own loader, either in ourself or in a remote process. And this could, in fact, also help us potentially defeat some more advanced products as well. So Jimmy, again, going to the internet, found a way to generate Meterpreter shellcode. But he also knows that this shellcode is very likely going to contain signatures, right? So are there ways to modify the shellcode to break detections? And Jimmy found a nice article of Huntress. I don't know if John Hammond is still somewhere in the audience, but Huntress is in fact where John is working. And Huntress posted a very nice blog post about the fact that most malware is using something called write over write 13 which means it is going to do a hashing of the um, strings that the API calls are doing. And most malware are in fact always doing the same thing. So most malware are in fact using write over write 13, which means it's pretty well known and is also very well, uh, very easy to signature those particular hashes that are generated by that particular algorithm. So what Huntress is in fact showing is the fact that if you have um, hashed strings, and you replace them, obviously, with something that is not going to work, right? Because replacing just the hash string with all ones is going to break the malware. But it's just to show that static detections are, in fact, present in, in shellcode as well. And that you can break it if you change the encryption algorithm or the file hashing algorithm. So if we take a look at that particular... Um, at, sorry, at that particular approach, we would actually see if we would upload on VirusTotal again um, some shellcode where we replaced the, um, the string hashing algorithm with something else, that the detection rates are in fact going to drop quite significantly. Now, taking this into practice, I'm pretty sure that most of you are familiar with a command and control framework called Cobalt Strike. Now, if you generate a payload, a, a stageless executable in Cobalt Strike, you're probably also going to be quite familiar with how that starts, right? It has that M-Z-A-R-U-H kind of string signature out there, which is in fact going to be a little bootstrap code that is just going to clear out some registries for the reflective loader to do its thing. So applying that knowledge, we could actually take that M-Z-A-R ASCII value and we could ask the internet, hey, could you please convert this ASCII, uh, these ASCII values to their byte representations? Now, we don't necessarily have to do this, of course, because we could just take them from the hex editor as well. But I just wanted to give you a bit of an overview of what you could do potentially manually. So with that said, you could convert ASCII 
two bytes. And then you could use, for example, an online decompiler. You just feed it the bytes. You say, hey, disassemble this for me, please. And we actually see that this is going to be a null operation because we are going to pop the R10 register and then push the R10 register, which effectively is actually doing absolutely nothing at all. So with that being said, we could now use our dear friend ChatGPT or BART or whatever um, machine learning thing that you would like to use. And we could feed it the prompt, hey, I would like to replace this, right? I would like to have a similar implementation of, in this case, push R10, pop R10. And I want it to use exactly four bytes because we want to overwrite that signature, which is four bytes long. So could you please generate me some alternatives that are going to do exactly the same thing? So just a null operation, but then in assembly level code. And BART is actually pretty capable of giving you some very nice alternatives. Now I tried this with ChatGPT as well and it didn't go very well. So that being said, depending on what you are trying to achieve, some language models are going to be better suited for your needs than others. And it was also in the interview that uh, Zivkon does for the speakers, where one of the questions is, hey, how do you feel about machine learning? Does it affect your workflow? And my answer to that was, it actually helps me uh, with my work, but I need to be already well informed about a subject matter to actually filter out what is real and what is made up. Because language models, are still not telling the truth 100% of the time. They are going to try and give you an answer to your question based on some algorithms that are essentially saying, hey, this is most likely what you are looking for, but if you are uninformed about matter and you just take whatever the machine learning algorithm uh, says as truth, well, you could actually end up with some disasters. So with that said, Bart actually did what it had to do and showed us some examples of um, replacement bytecodes that we could use to, for example, overwrite the bytes in the Cobalt Strike Loader and potentially break that first four byte signature. Now, this is a very basic example, but you could do this with full shellcode as well. And there are, of course, proof of concepts out there on GitHub, which just are capable of encoding or potentially even adding junk assembly instructions in your shellcode to make it harder to detect that it's going to be malicious. Is everyone still with me so far? Am I making sense? All right, awesome. So by doing this, just uploading that particular thing to VirusTotal, replacing some of the shellcode with alternative instructions, we are in fact capable of reducing our detection rate quite significantly, going from 17, which was already not that bad, to just two, which is already pretty good, right? So with that, with that said, Jimmy now knows that he could potentially modify shellcode to do its bidding and to potentially help evade detection. But Jimmy isn't as smart as some of the speakers here. Jimmy isn't as smart as Alessandro, doesn't know how to do all these low-level things without machine learning. So Jimmy is like, could I potentially find some more low langing fruit, which I could potentially use to my advantage so I don't necessarily have to start modifying this particular shellcode? And the answer to that is, well, yes. Jimmy could start creating his own loader. And if you want to create your own loader, Sector 7 actually has quite decent uh, courses on, <laughs> on how to do that but there are some desi design decisions that you have to take into consideration. The first thing that you would like to consider is, hey, do you want your particular payload to be staged or stageless? We're going to dive deeper into that in just a minute. Now, the language of your runner is also going to be quite important. And if you want to learn how to write loaders in particular languages, we still have that malware for dummy workshop that Kos is also doing. So I don't know if Kos is in the audience or not, but. If you're interested in that, you could potentially do that. And then, of course, we also need to make the design decision if we want to be on disk or in memory. So the first typical thing that you want to ask is staged versus stageless, right? Now, what is staged? Well, if you are going to create a staged payload, you are going to have a very small stub, which is going to fetch the much bigger 
malware or shellcode or whatever it is you're trying to achieve from a staged server, which is going to be accessible by your particular malware, or at least hopefully accessible, right? Depending on the proxy configurations of your victim, that could actually prove to be an issue, as we are going to see later on. Now, the advantages of using a staged payload is that it is smaller, so it is easier to embed in, for example, backdoor PEs, where you only have a finite code cave, which is rather small, so things like that could help. But using staged payloads inherently, with most frameworks out there, is considered to be very OPSEC unsafe, meaning that you will have to take matters into your own hand and have to have infrastructure capable of dealing with staged payloads, because if you're not doing it yourself and you're relying on frameworks like Metasploit, like even Cobalt Strike, you are going to run into issues as we are going to see in a few slides. Well, actually right now, to be honest. So this is a tweet by Rob Fuller. Uh, I think he was a speaker at ZeefCon as well last year or maybe two years ago. And uh, Rob here is using Cobalt Strike but he made one crucial mistake. He left staging enabled and he set his Steam server up to be accessible by the internet for everyone, right? He's not doing any kind of redirection. He just has it online so everyone can just reach it. Now, on the internet, the internet is for everyone, right? Meaning that the internet is getting scanned by a lot of bots out there and also some malware hunters as well, just automated bots trying to find malicious servers. Now what is interesting about these bots is if they find a open server, which is serving a payload, they can actually fetch that payload and execute it on a sandbox to see what exactly is going on. And this is what happened here, right? So Rob left this on for about, I think it was two or three days, and he returned to a very nice, a very successful campaign, right? Because he actually has a lot of beacons. But if you start looking at those beacons, you are going to see that none of them were actually what Rob, in this particular case, was trying to target in his operations. These are all going to be automated tools that pulled the stager from the Cobalt Strike server as it was publicly accessible and are now simply running the payload in a sandbox observing what it is doing and very likely feeding that intelligence back into threat intel platforms. So essentially this infrastructure is now completely burned and if Rob wants to have any type of success with his operation, he would have to rebuild his entire infrastructure. So probably not the way you want to go. Same thing, in this particular case we are using Metasploit, so if we're using Meterpreter and we use the staged payload. What's going on here is Meterpreter is going to serve that particular payload and if we would just browse to it, so we're not using the actual staged shellcode but we are browsing to the actual web server, well we are going to be able to hit it, it's not going to do any kind of redirection and we are going to be able to see the actual payload completely there, served for us, ready for analysis. And we can see that it is actually an executable because like Cobalt Strike, it also has MZARUH, which is not coincidental because Cobalt Strike does um, have a lot of similarities with Metasploit as it originally started as a project that was built on top of Metasploit. Now, another problem that you might encounter if you're using staged payloads is this very annoying thing where companies, especially mature companies, have web proxies. And these web proxies have lists of domain names that they will consider to be malicious. So for example, Rob's staging server that was completely detected, right? All these automated sandboxes know that this is probably attached to Cobalt Strike. They would have fed his domain to these proxies and it would show up as a malicious domain. Now whenever a user that is just browsing the internet is trying to reach a website that the um, proxy categorizes as malicious, it doesn't even have to be malicious, it just is not in compliance with that corporate policy 
then it is not going to be able to get browsed to. A lot of organizations do this, browsing for um, potentially blocking gambling websites, gaming websites, and plenty of other categories which are not so safe for work, right? So with that being said, you might opt to, hey, we should potentially use stageless payloads, right? Well, yes, I agree with you. I also really like stageless payloads, but stageless payloads have their own set of problems as well, depending on what language you are using. So here we have a tweet of Rastamouse. It's quite a while ago, but Rastamouse asks, hey, dumb question again, is there a sensible way of using stageless shellcode in C? Because Visual Studio takes a very, very long time to actually compile my payload because my C shellcode is so long that the compiler is just taking ages for it to finish. So with that said, the language of your dropper or your loader is going to start becoming a lot more important for your design implementation strategy. Meaning, if you, for example, want to use stageless payloads, there are ways that you could do this in C as well, but you might actually be easier off with a higher level managed programming language like C Sharp, for example. Now, depending on the language that you are using for your loader, it is also going to be easier for reverse engineers to observe what you are actually doing. Well, arguably easier, depending on whether or not you have your own obfuscation engines um, that you could potentially use. But for example, PowerShell, C Sharp, Java, all the higher level managed languages are notoriously easy to reverse engineer because if you just decompile the particular payloads, you would in fact see the source code as it would be written by the actual programmer. Now, of course, not again taking into account uh, obfuscators or maybe even encryption, right? Then we have scrutiny to consider as well. Again, a bit making fun of the CLR. CLR is the common language runtime which is loaded by any programming language that is using the .NET framework, so PowerShell, VBA, C Sharp. Well, whenever a process is using the CLR to interpret the code that is going on, MC is being loaded as well. So if you are programming on a higher level language, you will have to deal with MC. Now, we mentioned that there are, of course, bypasses for MC, but it is something that you have to consider. You don't have this problem if you, for example, would use C or C++, or maybe even Rust or NIM, right? Those things would not have the um, downsides of having to deal with MC. Then we have portability as well. Again, I had a pretty interesting conversation over lunch about using um, or writing malware into languages that are not by default being able to get interpreted by your Windows operating system. For example, Python is a very popular programming language, but unfortunately for the red teamers and the offensive tradecraft people out there, Python is not commonly installed on Windows operating systems, unless of course you're trying to, for example, target a developer. But a clean install of Windows does not, uh, is not capable of interpreting Python code, you would have to bring your own compiler for that. But depending on that, of course, you also don't have to deal with other security products or security issues like MC. So if you are in fact capable of bringing your own interpreter, you might want to consider a language like that. Now, unfortunately, that is often not going to be the case in a stealthy operation. Then we have size to um, take into consideration as well. For example, Go, Binaries are notoriously big, so they are going to be a lot bigger than if you would write your payload again in C. And then finally, you also have the matter of control. The lower level your language is going to be, the more fine-grained control you are going to have over your malware execution. For example, again, C is going to allow you to allocate memory, deallocate memory, free memory, so you would have a lot more control over how your process is actually going to flow, but that also has its downsides, of course, because if you're inexperienced with those kind of languages, you could have memory leaks, potentially even crashing systems as well. So those are all things that you would have to consider. Then we have technique of the runner, right? What do you want to do? 
do you want to inject into another process or do you want to stay into your own process? Because depending on what you want to do, there are some techniques available to you. If you want to do process injection, we had that example of vanilla process injection, which is just virtual alloc, write virtual memory, create remote thread, right? Very basic. But we also have other variations to this, like QUser APC, process hollowing, process herpederping, thread hijacking, early birds injection, all that kind of stuff. Then for the same process, we have create threads, so hijacking our own threads, potentially even doing threadless execution or using potentially weird API calls that have callback functions as well. Shout out to um, robgadget.com as they, they list, in fact, some API calls that you could use to achieve shellcode execution as well. Then on disk or on memory, I already mentioned it earlier on in my talk. If you are going to drop to disk, you have more things to consider in terms of static signaturing, which you would not have if you would be completely in memory. But depending on your use case, for example, if you want to do persistent, there's actually a pretty significant chance that you want to drop something to disk because inherently, if you want to persist, you will have to create an artifact. Typically, something that you drop to disk, or if you really want to be fileless, that would be a PowerShell download cradle that you used using like a, a scheduled task, for example, but that would be an obvious indicator of compromise as well. There are more stealthy things that you could do like DLL hijacking or COM hijacking, which requires you to actually drop something to disk. So to summarize all of this, if you want to create a quote unquote red team worthy payload, right? This is, of course, biased based on my own experiences. Your mileage, again, may vary. But if you ask me the question, hey, would you like to go staged or stageless? My answer would actually be, well, none of the above. Well, kind of. What I like to do is I like to decouple my execution, my malware, from my actual loader. So I do like to fetch my payloads to for example, a web server, which I adequately protect, right? Using, for example, redirecting rules. But I'd like to do that with a stageless payload. So I would like to serve my stageless payloads on a web server, encrypted potentially even, and using redirecting rules. And then, of course, I would fetch the actual stageless payload from the server in my own um, runner. Right? So that is what I like to do, but I also understand that some of you like to embed everything in the binary in those particular cases where, for example, you are afraid that your staging server might in fact not be reachable, or you have um, some edge case where you don't have direct internet connection or something like that. So I do get it, right? Both approaches would in fact work. I just like myself to have a stageless approach, but I fetch the stageless shellcode on a staging server. Then, what else? Design choice, right? If you are going to fetch it remotely, how do you want to do that? In the Windows world, you have two pretty well-known DLLs that allow us to do network communication over the internet. That's going to be WinINet or WinHTTP. Both of them behave rather similarly there are some nuances between the two, but they are two separate DLLs, right? So which one would you like to use? Which one are you most comfortable with? And then of course, again, what is going to be the target that you're operating against? Do they have web proxies? Do they have URL filtering? Do they have some kind of sandboxing mechanism? Do you want to encrypt your shell code? Do you want to uh, encode it? Do you want to do both? What is your approach, right? There is no good answer here everything could potentially work depending on the organization that you are facing. Language, again, biased opinion. I really like to write my malware in C and C++. Again, that's just me. If you like to use another language, it's perfectly fine as well. Just remember what I mentioned about scrutiny, right? If you are going to use the CLR, make sure you take things into account like ETW, like MC, all that kind of stuff. If you deal with it adequately, then of course you can totally get away with those languages as well. This also is going to translate to your own comfort level, right? If you are not a malware developer, if you have never done it before, if you are not experienced with low level coding languages, then it might make a lot of sense for you to use, for example, NIM 
or C sharp are things that you can pretty easily understand yourself. Because again, C is quite challenging. If you've never done it before, you could end up with things like memory leaks or corrupted function pointers. So you have to take those things into account as well. Then technique, and this is going to be the flavor of the month, right? This is where all the talks that we essentially see with offensive tradecraft come into play, right? This changes every single month, maybe even every single week if someone publishes new research, right? Indirect syscalls, stack spoofing, hardware breakpoints are probably the best way to go right now, again, depending on the organization that you are against. EDRs behave in different ways. Like if you are facing CrowdStrike, you might get away with, for example, starting in, uh, an exist overwriting an existing service binary path, but that might potentially not work if you are facing Defender for Endpoint, for example. And then of course, when it comes to persistence, again, heavily biased, I like to decouple my execution, meaning I don't like to be the own trigger of my payloads. I like that my target is actually going to execute the payloads when they see fit. This is going to make it harder, for example, for incident responders to figure out what the correlation is going to be. So a strategically hijacked COM object or a strategically placed DLL at a particular location and then just having the patience for the user to, for example, start Teams or start OneDrive or reboot their computer is going to get myself a new shell. Downside, you have no control over when it happens, so you'll have to assert patience. Upside, it is stealthier because it is harder to detect. Then on disk or, on, uh, or in memory, again, no good answer, completely biased. If you are doing initial access, I like to be fileless. If I am doing persistence, I like to be on disk. Again, this is just me, right? And then some additional OPSEC tips. The first one that I want to highlight is actually the second bullet point. Please, if you are writing malware, strip your debug symbols, right? It is very embarrassing if the blue team of an organization that you're red teaming against is like, hey, is this guy your malware developer? Well, how do you know? Well, we reverse engineered the binary and his freaking compile path was in the payload. So the name, for example, myself, Jean, was in fact embedded in the payload. So they knew, hey, this malware was written by Jean, right? So if you want to avoid that, strip the debug symbols. Very easy, it doesn't take that long to do, but it, depending on how you compile your payload is something that gets overlooked, right? Then time stomping could be an indicator of compromise, but could also be advantageous to you, again, depending on what the um, incident response and EDR products and antivirus products are looking for. But time stomping is overriding the file creation date of your file, so it blends in more. If you're going to drop a DLL into a directory where all the payloads or everything that it, are currently in that directory is compiled on 2021, and you suddenly drop something in there that was compiled in 2023, that again could be an indicator of compromise. So you could actually overwrite that to blend in a lot more and to set the clock back theoretically to 2021. And then cloning metadata is also something that gets overlooked quite often. It is going to be rather obvious if your payload doesn't contain any metadata because real vendors that are uh, creating real legitimate software will have metadata embedded inside of their particular executables. So if you don't set this up, by default your, for example, Visual Studio is not going to do that for you. It's going to look like the left instead of the right. It is going to be rather obvious that this is not a normal binary, right? Then finally, the best tip that I can give you, and I'm pretty sure all red teamers are going to say, yes, this is true, know your tools, right? If you are going to run malware in your uh, enterprises environment, know what it is doing. Don't rely on someone publishing a tweet, hey, I just released this very nice local privilege escalation zero day, here's the proof of concept. Don't just blindly compile it, drop it to disk, execute it, right? Because you could now inadvertently introduce a backdoor in that particular environment. 
always read the code that you're going to execute. Think about what you're going to execute, what is it going to leave behind in terms of artifacts. Do they have logging enabled, right? Do they, for example, have sysmon? Are they doing some kind of log forwarding? Know about the event IDs, take some research, try to place yourself in the shoes of the blue team to figure out if you are, in fact, going to be under the radar, right? If they have sysmon, for example, enabled, they are tracking sysmon event ID 1, and you now have uh, Mimikatz Sakurel logon passwords, well, guess what? It's going to show up as event ID 1. Oh, this was Mimikatz, this was the command line that was used, so that is definitely going to trigger an alert. Again, knowing your tools, as I mentioned, depending on the programming language, you'll be able to decompile the payload from a blue type, uh, a blue team perspective. So you will pretty easily see what is going on, right? If you decompile a payload and it has logon passwords, you are pretty certain what that particular payload is going to do, right? You don't even have to reverse engineer it. This as well, depending on what you are trying to do, you will have an import address table, you will have an export address table. So please don't, um, for example, if you are going to generate a DLL that is going to contain your malware, don't export a function called malware or run me or something like that because that is going to uh, look suspicious as well. Same thing. And then finally, enjoy your payloads. Um, if you take all these design principles into account, you're going to see that this was actually in 2022, well, end of 2022, so not that long ago, honestly. Um, Anon uh, used a uh, public proof of concept by um, Hazard Kuzad, or I, sorry if I butchered that, and he was in fact capable of running Mimikatz, on a Defender for Endpoint protected system where the risk level was just medium, so it wasn't really high or any alerts were triggered. So again, he didn't do any kind of fancy obfuscation or anything like that, right? Just used a custom um, PE loader to load that particular PE, Mimikatz, one of the highest signature PEs out there in memory, and it just worked. Then some additional research IDs, right? So I mentioned it stack spoofing, so Alessandro gave an excellent talk about it. Then we had um, Fabian, who um, released a tool recently as well. I think it's for syscalls. I don't know if that's true, because I actually didn't see the talk. I was in a workshop, but I'm pretty sure that it's going to give you some ideas as well to uh, evade some user land hooks. I guess that is what it is doing, so there you go. Then you have things like uh, Call Stack Smasher, which is uh, released by Cobalt Strike Team. Sys whispers that could help you potentially do sys calls or potentially even indirect sys calls. So there's quite a lot of tradecraft out there available for you. Do your own research. Again, know your tooling and things are going to be just fine for you. Right, so that's essentially it for me. Hopefully you enjoyed the trip down memory lane if you already are experienced. If not, hopefully I gave you some new insights and enjoy the rest of ZeefCon.